So I want to take off uh, from where uh, Maggie left and 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 try to um, uh, put this in in the kind of of um, a, a broader framework, uh, uh, especially um, going forward. Um, we we know that um, many low-income countries and and many in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, have actually done very, very well uh, in terms of overall economic growth in the last uh, 10, 15 years. So we have a period of uh, very uh, rapid economic development. Uh, yet, as, uh, as, as Maggie uh, said, and as comes out very um, clearly from the, uh, the chapters in, in, in this volume, uh, there are really very few countries, if any at all, with the exception of Vietnam, uh, yet another country in in Asia that have that has followed the the traditional path, the the, the classic path of growth through industrialization. So we have been doing a lot of thinking on on trying to understand what does that mean. Uh, is it that uh, these new generation of low income countries have uh, landed on sort of some kind of alternative path? Uh, of uh, high growth, or is it that there is something fundamentally unsustainable uh, about uh, the kind of growth that that we have experienced, and and the kind of, of sort of newer work that that we have done uh, with Maggie and also Jin Chen uh, Yao here uh, from IFPRI uh, sort of suggests maybe uh, a certain degree of caution uh, with respect to the sustainability. Uh, of this uh, more recent uh, growth experience. So that's basically the kinds of uh, reasoning is, is that, that I want to, uh, the reason behind that conclusion, uh, I want to, uh, to spend a few minutes on. Um, if we go back to uh, these patterns of structural change that we've been em emphasizing, um, uh, uh, you know, we can distinguish across sort of this, this traditional tripartite division of agriculture, manufacturing, and services, but also, of course, in the context of developing countries, very important to distinguish between more the, the informal and versus formal or the traditional versus modern types of activities, because in each one of these sectors, we typically have uh, both kinds of activities at the same time. And, and, and the historical uh, route to modernity, the historical way in which countries have uh, uh, developed is basically through the sequence of uh, first out of uh, traditional or informal agriculture into uh, sort of formal modern manufacturing activities and then uh, after um, a stage entering a sort of a post-industrial phase where they start moving into uh, more um, uh, uh, modern kinds of services and they begin to deindustrialize. This is the classic way in which not just the East Asian countries have developed, but before them, uh, of course, you know, Japan, another East Asian example, but an earlier example of rapid convergence. So if you want to go back to Germany or the United States, and, and in, indeed, uh, the very first example of a country that experienced modern economic growth, uh, Britain, uh, through the process of, of industrialization. Of course, in the more recent cases, the more recent uh, we look at, the more compressed this experience has tended to be. So what typically took place, uh, you know, Britain or Germany, uh, many, many decades, if not centuries, was compressed in South Korea and Taiwan to a period of uh, 30, 40 years. Now, in, in, when we look at the kind of countries that we, we analyzed in the uh, in this collection of, of cases and, and others that, that we've looked at, at since, um, the, the, the pattern that we're observing is a very different one. Uh, this is simply just you know, showing schematically what Maggie was saying, that it's not that people aren't leaving agriculture on average. It's not that people aren't going into urban areas out of uh, the countryside. So we have that movement out of agriculture and from the countryside, but they're going into very different kinds of activities. Uh, first, they're going very little into manufacturing, so that's that that's an arrow, um, and and most of it is actually more kind of informal manufacturing activities rather than necessarily formal manufacturing activities, and the real big arrow here, of course, is they're going into informal services, petty services, retail trade, um, uh, uh, of course, you know the kinds of services that we we're very. Uh, familiar with just from uh, you know sort of you know you'd be very familiar with just by visiting visiting these countries, and so it's not necessarily the high tech services of you know finance insurance um, uh, business services uh, IT 
uh, that is really absorbing uh, people who are coming out of the countryside. That's even true in India, by the way, which has, of course, uh, large uh, modern service sectors, uh, but uh, still uh, employment-wise absorbs a very small share uh, of the entire labor force. So this is, this is the pattern uh, that we're experiencing uh, today. Um, and on the face of it, uh, you would think that uh, sort of this is, uh, is one that would not be conducive uh, to significant productivity gains uh, from structural change. Uh, but when you look at the data, uh, you know, you, we, we were a little bit surprised to find that in fact in many of these low-income countries you still have significant gains of labor productivity that's uh, occurring from structural change. Uh, so uh, this is um, uh, um, more recent work, again, this, this draws from uh, this most, more recent work I mentioned, including with, with Jin Chao, uh, Jin Chan and, um, and, and, and Maggie. Um, and there's a lot of stuff here, but maybe if we could just focus on the one that's sort of um, uh, in, 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 the, um, in the square there. Uh, so if you look at a bunch of low-income countries and, and um, look at their experience, uh, before and after their respective growth acceleration. So for every one of these low-income countries, most of them are in sub-Saharan Africa, but not all. We look at sort of what has been the pattern of, uh, you know, this fundamental growth decomposition that, that Maggie talked about. Uh, we see that in the decade uh, after the growth acceleration, this component of structural change, this red bar, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is very large. It's almost half of uh, the increase, half of, of um, uh, the actual growth rate in, in these low-income countries. And this is happening despite, uh, as I said, absence of any kind of significant industrialization. So this was in some sense, this is in some sense the, 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 the puzzle. Uh, if you look at the within component, um, so looking at the, the orange versus the green, or depending on how you see it, yellow versus blue, uh, my screen and that screen are showing different colors. Um, <laughs> Uh, you, you see that, in fact, the within component is mostly concentrated also in agriculture, uh, whereas uh, the uh, within component of labor productivity within sectors in non-agricultural sectors is actually relatively small. And that's an issue that I'll come back to because I think it's part of the explanation of the puzzle. But the main point here is, is, is it is not the case that these low-income countries, as in fact I would have thought, have not experienced significant labor productivity gains out of structural change. They have. The question is, how do we square it uh, with a very different model of industry, with a very different model of growth uh, from the standard East Asian or the historical pattern? Let me give you, uh, to get a little bit of, of, of insight into these cases, you know, two interesting cases, Ethiopia and India, uh, in our sample of uh, countries that have experienced, you know, growth accelerations. This is both sort of the sample that we looked at in this paper that combines the low-income and the middle-income countries. So there are a lot of Latin American countries as well here, uh, but I'll be focusing on the low-income countries. And two, two countries uh, in terms of Ethiopia and India. Uh, so if you want to understand, I think, the growth experience of these two countries recently, in both cases, I think a key um, uh, uh, proximate determinant of growth uh, turns out to be what has happened to investment, uh, investment rates in these countries. In the case of Ethiopia, uh, it is actually largely public investment, um, uh, public investment rates uh, in um, in the, um, uh, I guess, the, where you would see it would be the, the, the red, um, uh, on the right-hand side chart uh, with respect to um, uh, the total investment rate. Um, and, and you can see that increasing uh, quite significantly uh, uh, from uh, around perhaps 20, per 20 percentage point to, to nearly 40 percentage po uh, points of, of, of GDP. So very large uh, uh, you know, public investment uh, boost. And so when we talk about Ethiopia's growth, often we're talking about sort of increasements, increases in productivity, uh, particularly in the rural sector that has come from road building, energy, uh, sort of connecting markets, uh, improvements in agriculture, and, and so forth. And so sort of this, this big public investment boom, uh, a boost has been a, 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 a big force uh, behind that. 
Uh, in the case of India, uh, again, we see a very large uh, um, increase in, in, in investment, but in this case, it's, it's, it's mostly um, uh, private investment. You can see on, now on the, on the left-hand side, um, the, uh, the increase in private investment, again, a near doubling of the investment, overall investment rate, which as you can see from the right hand side is really coming from the private sector rather than the public sector. So here they have a little bit more explain explaining to do, which is, you know, where, where did the Indian uh, uh, entrepreneurs and investors suddenly get their animal spirits so worked up? What were they thinking? Um, to some extent, uh, it's a bit of a, of a bootstrapping, I would argue, because it, it seems to be justified by the overall growth rate of the economy, which in turn uh, is, uh, is, is, is driven uh, uh, by the investment as well. And, and, and the mechanism of structural change driven product, uh, of productivity change uh, is in some sense um, uh, validating that, that increase in animal spirits in an in in interesting kind of a way that, that I'll come to in a second. In both of these cases, uh, whether it's Ethiopia or, or um, in, 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 uh, in India, you don't see the manufacturing. Uh, so this is not driven by what's happening in the manufacturing. If you look at uh, where the jobs are coming from, uh, very clear, for example, this is just one example, Rajasthan, after 2005, uh, basically all the jobs that are coming out of uh, agriculture and countryside are really going to construction. It's, it's really, you know, that's, it's, it's not coming into, into manufacturing. Okay. So, um, uh, what we, we, we suggest uh, in, in this newer work is, is, is a kind of a, a different type of a, of a growth model uh, that explains uh, what's happening and explains how you can get a lot of structural change uh, that is also um, uh, providing for significant uh, labor productivity boost and therefore in some sense uh, are justifying that in initial increase in investment but do so only in a kind of a temporary kind of a way because uh, it doesn't seem to be a very sustainable uh, uh, kind of a way to, to, uh, to drive long-term growth. So the argument would be something like this. Imagine that uh, there is an exogenous increase in investment. It might be a public investment drive as in the case of Ethiopia. It could be sudden, you know, an exogenous increase in the animal spirits of the, of the, uh, of private sector as in the case of, of, of India. Just that, imagine that's, that's the shock. Now, of course, we know that investment is one of our fundamentals. So if you increase overall investment in the economy, you're going to increase uh, the ability to, you know, you're going to have a direct effect on labor productivity. Everybody's working with more capital or you're undertaking investments in public infrastructure that's going to increase uh, productivity in the countryside, in the, in the rural areas. So you're going to get, have the standard conditional convergence kind of a uh, growth that is being generated. Uh, out of this investment push. Um, now, uh, as I said when I was sort of, you know, briefly was asked to uh, come in uh, during Maggie's presentation, this kind of conditional convergence that's based simply on, um, on uh, an increase in fundamentals is not going to necessarily drive a lot of growth unless you have some reason why, additional reason why productivity is increasing very in rapidly at the same time. And in these countries, in Ethiopia and India, structural change is providing that additional increase for very rapid productivity growth. Why? Well, because I think it's, 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 the argument is that there is what's happening on the demand side uh, becomes very important here, which is that um, you know, as, as you improve incomes, let's say, in, in, in the countryside uh, through this increase in, in uh, investment on, in, in, in public services or public inputs, you're in, the increase in demand uh, is going to show up mostly as increased demand for services. Um, now, uh, that increased uh, demand for services, therefore, induces structural change. So that as, as the investment goes, uh, you know, whether it's private or public, it generates higher income. At the margin, most of that higher income is actually spent not on the countryside, but is spent on services. So that induces demand for uh, more uh, services. Um, and that essentially uh, uh, pulls uh, results in, in structural change because now resources are being pulled out of agriculture uh, and into services, which is where uh, the demand is. So you have, as people are getting richer, they're demanding more construction or, 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 or better uh, um, uh, retail trade, and that's really the, 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 the mechanism through which you get structural change. And because on average, 
those services, even if they are poorly organized, are still higher productivity than those in countryside. You're getting significant productivity boosts through these investment demand-induced uh, uh, kind of structural change. So, so far, so good, because you're getting uh, you know, uh, increase in productivity that therefore is actually uh, uh, justifying the in initial increase in investment. Um, however, uh, the downside of this is what you're doing is now you're putting, sort of you're expanding your services uh, that as the demand for services expands, so to speak, you're, you're, you're beginning to travel down uh, the marginal value uh, of labor curve uh, of, your, your, of your services. Uh, so therefore, what you're going to see is that this expansion of services is actually going to come along with a lagging productivity or actually productivity decline in your services. Uh, because what's driving it is the demand side. It's not the supply side of more productivity in these modern activities that's driving this structural change. So as productivity then begins to lag uh, in, the, uh, in these um, uh, modern but service-based activities, um, uh, then essentially the gap of productivity between the traditional and the, and the modern uh, begins to also uh, get closed uh, so that, that, that this is not a self-sustaining process, it's actually a self-extinguishing uh, kind of a process that cannot, that cannot uh, keep going on. Let me just give you a, a, a bit of, of sort of empirical evidence on, 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 this, on this mechanism about the, the fact how poor performance uh, in these service activities in the urban areas, uh, whether modern or sort of informal, uh, is, really, is really acting as a, as a, as a drag on these economies. Um, so um, when we looked at, at, across countries, uh, this is a little bit, might be a little bit difficult to read, but so I'll just tell you what the, what the main uh, result is. Um, so when we looked at the countries where structural contri uh, change contributed the most to this overall growth in labor productivity, uh, we also found that these were the countries which had the worst productivity experience uh, in the non-agricultural uh, sectors of the economy. Uh, so the more, the bigger the structural change component, the worse the productivity performance precisely in those sort of modern uh, services. So again, consistent uh, with a demand side story rather than a supply story uh, that's, that's, uh, that's driving structural change. Something that, that is a little bit uh, um, perhaps more directly, um, uh, and, and I think in some sense uh, more alarming directly, is when you look at uh, individual uh, service sectors uh, in across countries, and here I'm showing you two of them: wholesale and retail trade versus community and, and community and personal services. You look at which are the sectors that have done the best in terms of productivity growth. Um, those are the sectors that, in fact, have ex expanded the least. Uh, and the sectors that have expanded the most are the ones which have uh, experienced the worst productivity performance. So when you're forcing these sec modern uh, sectors to expand, uh, I'm sorry, when you're forcing these service sectors to expand, you're also forcing them to actually uh, down towards lower productivity paths. Now, I would say that this is a key difference between this kind of growth model and the traditional industrialization kind of a growth model. Uh, is that in the traditional model, when you had manufacturing, uh, basically as workers came into manufacturing, there was, you know, manufacturing could expand and could um, uh, um, uh, export to the rest of the world. So there was essentially no constraint on replicating um, uh, this, this high productivity uh, enclave, the manufacturing, it could sort of simply scale up and grow. Uh, but essentially, these low productivity services, well, they're relatively low productivity services, cannot act as growth poles, uh, since as they expand, they're effectively going to be experiencing lower productivity at the same time. So um, this, this, is, um, uh, this is, I think, um, where we are in terms of, of, of our thinking about this. Um, the, the, the bottom line is uh, there is something very different. Uh, about the recent growth. Uh, it is not based on industrialization. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, uh, 
However, structural change still, still seems to be have played a role, but this is a structural change largely into uh, labor moving into service activities. And since those activities still have relatively high productivity for those economies, they have contributed large uh, amounts of overall productivity to, uh, to overall growth. Uh, but what we see, and that's the, our question mark or our concern on the sustainability, is that the more you do this, uh, the more rapidly you're actually running down productivity precisely in those uh, service activities, and that we don't see something um, self-sustaining and self-generating in the same way that we saw uh, in the export-oriented industrialization cases, cases uh, earlier uh, that can uh, sustain growth into the future. Or to put it differently, this is much more, the structural change is much more a demand side phenomenon uh, rather than a supply side phenomenon driven uh, by underlying productivity growth uh, in the urban areas of the economy. And that's uh, where we are concerned. So um, I'll stop here.